Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, we welcome you all here. Come on in. My name is Carolina McCarran, um, SSA student, and I am extremely honored to introduce our three um, speakers and lecturers today. And I have a feeling from what I've heard that it is not often that the three of you are in the same place at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that we're very lucky to have um, these three women here to speak with us today. Um, right on my left is Professor Maria de los Angeles Torres. And she is the director and professor of Latin American and Latino studies at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And her areas of specialization include, um, I'm sure among many others, comparative politics of US Latinos, US Latin American relations, Cuba and its exiles, transnational political movements, youth politics in the Americas, and Latin American political thought. She's currently working on two research projects, Children and Youth Politics in the Age of Globalization, funded by Chapman Hall and the Kellogg Foundation, and Comparative Civic Engagement in Three Latino Communities, COPI for a National Science Research Foundation project. And next is Professor Norma Alicia Del Rio Lugo, and she's a full-time researcher, professor, um, titular C of Psychology at the Department of Education and Communication of the Metropolitan Autonomous University Xochimilco mm -hmm. in Mexico City. And she's the head of the research program on infancy and childhood and of the Center of Documentation on Infancy. Um, her current projects include um, a Dizionario, a tool to promote the discovery of new possible worlds in collaboration with the Director of Indigenous Education of the State of Michoacan and the Institute of Computational Linguistics. And what we're here to talk about today, the Youth Civic Engagement, a uh, three-city study of Chicago, Mexico City, and Rio de Janeiro. And then last but not least is Professor mm -hmm. Rosini, who spoke with us this morning and um, really, I think, started our day off on a really great note and very grateful that you're, you're all here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I've been designated to start. Um, so um, first of all, I want to thank you uh, and thank the students really for organizing this conference. Uh, it's great to uh, be able to share with you experiences that um, have are, are starting uh, to uh, bear fruit here because uh, I think international perspectives um, were are, are still hard to grasp in part because that's not the way we really organize our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's usually not the way that scholarship is organized, and um, it is, it's hard to put together comparative studies that um, really get to some of the questions that, that we're interested in. Um, what I wanted to do was maybe give a little background to the project, because I really see this as a workshop. Um, we're not as organized as Malcolm was <laughs> uh, in terms of our data. It is an ongoing project. Um, so to share with you our experiences in putting together an international project, maybe um, spend a little time with the theoretical and linguistic challenges that um, we are grappling with, uh, and um, talk a little bit about the research methodology itself and where we're at, and then turn it over to my colleagues. Obviously, at any point in time, if I say something that's like, a, that if I'm forgetting something, okay, mm -hmm. or if you want to add something, please jump in. This project, in part, um, started out of, uh, I'm a political scientist, so I'm really in a whole different um, area, but started as a uh, question for me um, that came from a previous uh, project that I had done on Cuban refugee children, minors uh, at the time, uh, called at the time. Um, in the 1960s, it came over uh, to the United States. There was 14,000 unaccompanied children. And I really was um, left thinking about that in terms of what had happened to children in the context of modernism and nation building. And given that that was 40 years ago, I then asked the question, well, if modernism had constructed children in a certain way that led to certain policies, we're no longer in that epoch. Uh, but what is it that children and young people say about their world, all right, instead of trying to theorize what is it uh, about the world? And I was lucky enough to have uh, Pastora Cafferty um, Sang Huang as somebody who's always been very close, who introduced me to Harold, 
who then introduced me to Irene and to uh, Mark Courtney, who asked me to spend a year at Chapin, really being able to retool since political socialization was not something that I had um, really done anything with uh, since graduate school. And so here we are, thanks to uh, Pastor and to Harold. Um, I think the intention was to then look at um, uh, engaged youth, and uh, that is, um, I, I have lots of colleagues who study political participation, and what we know about young people really uh, from across the world is that young people are very much like adults, that they don't participate politically a lot, uh, particularly in uh, more, um, you know, uh, democratic systems. and that there has been, in fact, a decline uh, in adult participation, and so therefore there's a crisis in democracy, and so we're trying to think, okay, well, what, what's the next generation like? Are they doing something? So we, we know a, a lot, I think, well, a lot. We know more about the unengaged uh, and uh, um, apolitical youth than we know of those who are engaged, and so, we started really thinking through what it meant to be engaged and to really define, in a certain sense, and find young people who were out there making a difference in the world outside their own private lives. And there weren't that many of them, but we thought it was very important for us to understand how it is that they had gotten there. And I started the Chicago Project um, while I was at Chapin a couple of years ago and basically uh, worked with various community organizations that are involved in youth empowerment projects to help get them to help me identify who were really the most articulate, the most engaged, um, very consciously selecting a very, very biased sample because those are the young people that um, we were interested in talking to. We ended up with 25 youth, and then that ended up, after I taught a class on uh, youth and nation building, um, to 40. Um, but the, the main sample that we're working with on a comparative basis were 25 in-depth interviews uh, in different community organizations. And, you know, I've done some preliminary analysis that will then help us sort of do some comparative with this. but. There were a couple of really interesting things that came out of the Chicago um, project, and I just want to share that before we get to some of the theoretical challenges. But there, um, many of these youth um, actually, uh, I think only two of them have families that are also involved in some kind of politics, whether it's precinct work uh, and one Puerto Rican young woman uh, and fundraising uh, for one African American um, young woman. But what they all shared was someone in their family that had respected them as a kid when they were little and allowed them to speak their mind and listen to them at home. Not necessarily that parents encouraged kids to be involved in politics. In fact, particularly in the case of immigrant kids, parents discouraged that because they didn't want the uh, light uh, or the attention um, on their families. But even those uh, youth felt that their, their role in the family was one that they brokered an outside world for their parents, and as such, they were respected in that family. So that's a very, you know, kind of interesting, I mean, I wasn't expecting to find that. Um, the identity politics still is very, uh, in uh, a defining um, um, set of forces for uh, young people in Chicago, um, that is race, gender, ethnicity matter in the ways that young people identify themselves, even as they are also identifying as a member of a youth uh, group, that is. So they'll be, you know, involved in, uh, and very conscious that they're, 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 they're youth, but all these other intervening uh, factors are also part of um, how they organize themselves. There's a quest for equality. I mean, most of the kids came from community organizations, which meant that they were neighborhood-based organizations. Um, there's a, uh, what, in, in a sense, the projects that they're involved with uh, and the projects that they see themselves being involved with in the future really have to do with a quest for equality. You know, that is a better distribution of educational services, uh, um, uh, uh, 
better services for their own communities and for their families that they are very conscious that they don't receive the, the same kind of education as kids in other parts of the city or in the suburbs all right um, their their very their their sense of rights are very are embedded in a, in the American political experience their individual rights you know the right to speak the right to you know um, walk out in the street without being told that they can't you know it's a it's a very individually based set of rights um, but they also th feel many of them that they are responsible for representing another image of what it is to be youth because they're also conscious that youth are targeted as um, a, a, a negatively through popular culture so they feel a sense of responsibility to also um, you know create another another image um, there's a lot of discussion in the literature about global and local and how globalization was going to bring us together and let us do things together at least this set of young people are very much rooted in local politics they are conscious of the fact that they live in the most powerful country in the world they would like for that country to be a little kinder to other countries many of them are against the war, uh, the war but their day-to-day -day politics really unfold in their neighborhoods and in their schools so um, again there may be class differences here to where those who go to better schools and have more resources in their families don't have to fight for basic educational rights but in this set uh, of, of young people <coughs> that becomes very important and that's a little bit sort of you know about two years worth of work and you know five minutes here um, and at that if during this time I had really you know started to think about Chicago as a global city and what it meant to be part of you know connected to the world and what it meant to have many worlds within one city and um, because of Chapin's um, uh, networks international network um, we started really thinking of doing this internationally and um, we were lucky enough to receive uh, funding from uh, the Kellogg Foundation to let us do this study in Mexico uh, City and in Rio and the first challenges I think that we faced besides the fact that it's hard to get from place to place and funding for international work is really it's a lot harder to get than it is for doing other kinds of research um, were theoretical and linguistic challenges all right um, I think theoretically I was coming at this uh, really thinking about modernism and postmodernity and you know children's place in modernism in terms of nation building and the promise of the future and what happens when uh, national projects fail in a certain sense to really deliver on the promise on you know as we sit here in this campus the John Dewey promise that in order to have good solid healthy democracies we needed to have a strong educational system because you can't be uh, uninformed and really participate and engage politically um, so I was thinking you know modernism post-modernity uh, you know the failures of national projects the um, uh, th this idea of children as the future versus the present all right again there's a temporality I think to these various eras that may be distinct which then changes um, our understanding of the place of children and our commitment towards children and we just sort of spent two hours I think yesterday <laughs> you know trashing modernity <laughs> as a hopelessly kind of um, a, a concept a historical concept that is embedded with a lot of history and assumptions about what it means and this kind of thing although um, we're, we're trying to see what are the threads that maybe are present in these various countries which at the end were countries that were part of an American project right it is a um, you know it is they're born of indigenous and African um, and European cultures but they were sort of experimental in the sense of the world stage so we're trying to find threads of commonality with the understanding that these concepts are mined with a lot of uh, assumptions that we need to be careful when we apply them the other sort of huge one is democracy all right again the assumption here that you need to have informed citizens I think we would all 
you know, uh, uh, we, uh, we would agree that that is something that ties us together, but what exactly is democracy? And what were the various forms of uh, conceptions of democracies that may have emerged in our particular countries and what's different about them, you know, not just structurally, but conceptually. And um, so we have to, when we're thinking of political participation, that's one of the, again, uh, issues that we need to be very careful in how we understand the differences in our commonalities. The other one is globalization, and globalization is huge, all right? I mean, I sometimes when people say, well, do you believe or not in globalization? I mean, I think globalization is. I mean, there is, you know, there's lots of ways of <coughs> defining it. We can think of, you know, all the promises that globalization gave us. In fact, part of the reason that we're all around here talking about this is because there is a, an awareness that we live in a much more interconnected world. On the other hand, globalization has brought incredible inequality in terms of those who have and those who have not. It's brought bifurcated economies in ways that we maybe have never seen before. Um, it's brought, you know, representation, I mean, uh, social formations of cities as opposed to nation states. And nation states maybe don't matter to some of us unless you're trying to cross a border coming in. And so it is, it, it's a complex period where, you know, politics maybe doesn't mean or participation may not mean as much as it did when there was the possibility of, you know, broader middle classes. Um, and there's been, well, the economic changes in terms of opportunities and the social changes because there has been, I think, in this epoch of, you know, globalization slash postmodernity, neo-colonial, whatever words at the end we decide, there's been an abandonment of, a, of commitments to really um, taking care of and educating um, uh, uh, societies. Um, there's also the question of place, again, where do people live and how do they, you know, how do their their day-to-day -day lives um, come in. I'm, I've become a little bit more conscious of that because I'm working with geographers in, in another project. And, you know, just um, when we think of this city, for instance, the neighborhoods, how clearly defined they are along racial and ethnic lines, and what that means, and how people then define their politics within that, and how young people engage with that, is very particular. And those are things that we're going to have to really try to understand in, in, in each of the cities. And the two others that I think are the, you know, kind of the theoretical here and the linguistic challenges that we have um, is participation. I think there has been a lot of work in the United States, this idea that it's not just voting, but rather engagement uh, in public um, events. We struggle with defining what we mean with that. I mean, in the sense, is it you know, uh, if, if doing community service to pad your resume, is that the same thing as going out and, you know, getting people to sign petitions to um, support more resources for school uh, because it needs better college counselors, all right? So trying to make distinctions between kinds of public activities and how youth themselves are defining that. Um, uh, again, because image is so important to many of the youth here in Chicago, and we have found in a little bit in, in other cities, and Norma, maybe, you know, when you talk about this, you could really talk about media work. Um, art and media work uh, uh, becomes very important, and I kind of say, well, this is the postmodern, right, you know, kind of preoccupation with image, but it's the still the old-fashioned you know, I'm being discriminated because I'm an African-American youth or I'm a Latino youth and therefore I have to change this image, that you really have two sets of concerns co uh, colliding in a certain sense to create challenges, political challenges for these young people that uh, things like video production do become very important at the same time that they also understand that so are just old-fashioned protests, you know, down uh, at the Board of Education. The last one that we're really, really grappling with is, you know, what is a youth, all right? I um, mean, here we are, we're doing comparative um, engagement. And by the way, engagement, you know, when we talked about participation, 
We know what engagement means, but I think Irene sent out a description of the project to England and somebody said they wanted to know we were like studying, you know, kids who were about to be married, you know, get married. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so uh, that's, that's also, I mean, and is it leadership versus protagonism versus agency? But youth is a really hard mm -hmm. category to pin down, all right? Um, I mean, I, I am, am, we're, we're trying to figure out how and when and if youth is a socially constructed category that's meaningful in the cities that we are working with. And um, we may, at the end, decide that it's not quite the same way in each one of our areas. I mean, I suspect youth is a consumer category. I suspect it is also a category to be consumed, particularly in a hyper-sexualized, um, you know, uh, imagery of young people uh, that we see every day, you know, in advertisement. But it's also in part because of this and maybe because there are all sorts of um, the, the kinds of old commitments that we had as societies towards education and towards children which have never, by the way, been distributed equally. Our concerns have also had all sorts of, you know, class and racial um, uh, divides in, in terms of our concerns and our delivery of that. That it also creates a site for potential uh, contestation, uh, either of that construction or of it becoming, potentially becoming a vehicle for empowerment, you know. And how that occurs will probably be very different. But instead of us theorizing what it means to be young, what it means to be political, what it means to be global and all that, we decided to set up a research project that basically relied on the narratives of young activists. All right, so we are bringing our bias into this saying we are interested in young activists and we do have some understanding across the three cities of what that activism may mean. Um, so we, we, we're listening, okay, that is the, the, just the first step. We, age is something we had originally talked about maybe, I had wanted to start real early, my colleagues at Chapin uh, really dissuaded me from that, thinking developmentally adolescence was a stage that had all sorts of characteristics and so my, this, my sample really runs from 11 to 19 and, um, but we, as we found out yesterday, age is really a young, we would never call a 29-year-old a young person here, right? That's a young adult. Uh, whereas in Brazil, that is a youth, all right? And in Mexico, it may be another age. Yeah, so we've had more, to have... More in Mexico. More in Mexico, Mexico yeah. 29, yeah. 29, but 29, 29, 26, 29. yeah. A young activist could, have, could be 26. Yeah. So youth we... 24. Yeah. 18 sort of our top here, okay? So again, this changed a little bit the parameters that we had really put together, you know? And again, then we started thinking about, okay, in terms of age, is it, you know, and this is something I really want you to talk about because I think you're very, um, the way that you said it, at least yesterday, was very convincing. But, you know, you have a lot of young people who even after they go to school, there's no jobs. So you really do have this extension. You know, you become responsible when you have a family, right, or when you have a job. Well, if you, especially if you have a job because then you're a provider, but if you don't have a job, I mean, you can't really be a responsible adult. So some of the reasons that that category has maybe expanded in, in, in other countries is precisely because of the lack of economic opportunities in order to be responsible, all right? Um, whereas here, it, we may have, you know, there's lots of people saying youth is sort of invading the space of the 20s because baby boomers, you know, don't want to grow up. And so therefore, you know, baby boomers now want to dress like, you know, our teenage daughters or whatever, you know. And so there's, there's different dynamics at work here in terms of age that we have to grapple with in order to kind of do, you know, some minimal compar uh, com uh, comparison. Um, activist or something, again, that I think we did define that is letting us talk to different people, although again, 
activism and what exact, how active the person needs to be uh, may be different from um, site to site. And lastly, we did start with a common protocol of some basic kinds of questions. I mean, just backgrounds, letting people tell their narratives, um, certain questions about how they got involved, uh, what it meant to be involved, how they define some of these broader issues, how they define themselves. So there is a common protocol that obviously, even when I was using the protocol here, with 25 youth changes because, as you know, when you're doing qualitative interviews, you're not going to tell somebody who's telling you this incredible story, well, you know, okay, now we've got to go on to the next question. Mm -hmm. You know, so there is a, um, there is a, a, a fuzziness about, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the protocol that we are assuming as really part of something that's going to allow us maybe to have a richer discussion. Um, we are, and I'm going to end with this and turn this over, but um, we, we did succeed uh, in, again, our two days of meetings, and we're just coming off of that. I mean, I think you said we left our brains on the table. <laughs> That's what Malcolm told me you had said, but uh, we're trying to pick them back up. Um, we did actually end up having a discussion about how we thought we could present some of this data, and, and uh, Norma and Irene are still in the middle of their interviews, okay, so they're not done yet, but um, you know, questions that will let us code some of these narratives in similar ways. And um, so for now we're working with three sort of very broad categories that I, I bet will change in the next six months, but for now um, we're thinking about all the things that allows a youth to become, in a certain sense, political. All right, that is the, the process of becoming. Um, secondly, engaging all the various forms of engagements, the projects of engagement, the kinds of engagement, that kind of stuff. And thirdly, sort of their envisioning, that is, what is, what, what are, why are they doing this? Okay, what are the underlying ideals that are framing for these young people, um, their political actions, however those may be defined. And again, I, I am a political scientist, but I define politics very broadly. So we left ourselves the task for the next time that we meet um, is to really start thinking about the one, about youth, right? Youth and what that means in each one of our um, cities. Um, maybe something like youth in the public imagination. And secondly, the part of participation in politics and perhaps place, um, youth in public places, <clears throat> all right, which could lead us also to some of the difficulties around um, notions of globalization and modernity and temporality. So okay. I think that's. That was my version of what we just did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm listening. I, I recognize it. <laughs> 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 very, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Norma? Well, uh, <clears throat> I work uh, uh, at a public university in Mexico City. And uh, we have been uh, working now for six years in a research program. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary program uh, between the three campuses uh, that, uh, uh, of uh, professors and researchers that have been working in different areas uh, uh, related to childhood. And so uh, we have um, uh, formed a uh, different um, um, uh, lines of, common different lines of, of research. Uh, but uh, the three lines of research uh, have in common the Convention of the Rights of the Children. I mean, uh, it's been uh, um, um, one of, the, of the, our main uh, goals in this research program is to uh, do research in a networking uh, form of uh, work. And uh, we have um, um, set up uh, all the network, the local networks that we have uh, been working with, uh, with civil uh, organizations and uh, government 
uh, organizations in order to uh, be able to work in, a, in, an, in another way so that uh, the academic uh, work may not be done as a, from an office, but right in the, uh, in the fields. And uh, so um, we, we are not part of this uh, uh, Child Watch uh, International Network uh, and uh, trying to um, get uh, some these uh, uh, lines of research that uh, we have been working on on a regional basis. Uh, and uh, this is our first collaborative research uh, in this sense. And uh, as uh, Nena said, uh, <clears throat> we have some challenges here. Uh, one of them is uh, the three di different languages. Uh, the other one is uh, this uh, pre preoccupation of uh, making research uh, with a child participation uh, focus in which uh, we are, instead of theorizing, we are um, just uh, wanted to, uh, to listen to the, to the voices and make them write their own version of what, who they are, why are they participating, and may, uh, providing a space for reflection and uh, meeting and encounters uh, between the different uh, youths in a city that uh, is very, uh, uh, it's a very complex uh, space so that, that they may be able to uh, interchange and meet each other in this uh, sense. Um, we, we want to also, uh, in a later phase, to be able to uh, interchange with uh, the Chicago boys and girls and, mm -hmm. and the Rio uh, de Janeiro, um, maybe in uh, reading their texts in their own language or interchanging uh, some of the uh, views and uh, through the through the use of the media. Huh? Uh, so uh, uh, the, this project not only has uh, some products that are very uh, definite, but uh, we are also interested in in the process of uh, of, uh, of um, this part kind of participation of uh, these uh, these children and. Um, we we are um, trying also to create new networks with uh, adolescents in in another sense, like uh, 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 Nena said, uh, with with this global and local uh, <laughs> paradigm of uh, modernity. Uh, <clears throat> I want to to give you some uh, very brief. Uh, data about uh, Mexico. I think you are very uh, familiar <laughs> with some of uh, our uh, main uh, issues. Uh, migration is one of uh, our uh, main uh, preoccupations as a, as a country. We, we are uh, now uh, 110 million people in, the, in Mexico as a country. Uh, and we have uh, about 50% um, of our people are on the living in un under conditions of po poverty. Although the levels, uh, uh, official ciphers of uh, poverty uh, are uh, less if they are defined by $1 or $2 <laughs> in a month, we have a Gini index co uh, coefficient of uh, unequal distribution of about uh, 58, uh, 0. 0.58. Uh, that's uh, one of the most uh, unequal, like uh, Brazil. We, in, in this sense, we share many of, uh, of the uh, social ec economic situations and conditions of, um, of inequality that uh, just characterize, and I think it's part of this globalization uh, uh, tendency that uh, in this world we are living in. Uh, Mexico City has uh, 
about 12 million people if we are considering also the metropolitan area. Uh, and uh, as a city, it's, uh, it's uh, well, it's, uh, you could say that it's a privileged uh, city in the sense that uh, it has many access and services and educational options for children and youth that you, you wouldn't find in, an, in other uh, parts of the country. Uh, there is, um, uh, in this sense, you could say that uh, the uh, Mexico City is, uh, is, uh, is, um, is not very uh, typical of uh, representation of what is Mexico because uh, one, I think one of the characteristics that uh, Mexico has is uh, this uh, very diverse and multicultural uh, uh, panorama of, uh, uh, of cultures, languages, and people that just have been rec recognized as, uh, as such, as uh, uh, Mexico as a nation. And it has been a recent uh, movement that uh, in part was because of the Zapatista revolt that made all this uh, social pressure about the need for uh, not a monolithic uh, politics, um, but a uh, uh, diverse uh, and uh, more inclusive kind of policies that are just beginning to, uh, to take in the form of uh, some changes and reforms in the laws, but uh, from the laws to, to making a real policy, there is a just a, a great gap. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in about, uh, uh, relative to education, uh, we have um, uh, most uh, universal access to a um, primary to the first six grades, Almost, uh, we have uh, we have uh, gotten ev uh, almost all all the children in schools, but uh, uh, the quality of education is very questionable. The recent uh, the recent re results on literacy uh, skills in sixth grade and in junior high junior high school. Uh, <clears throat> are very um, discouraging <laughs> about the, the role that the school is making in really uh, giving skills uh, to, the, to the, our young children. It's, uh, um, we have these uh, indices uh, on literacy skills where the private schools ju just have uh, like a, a 4% of uh, children that do not uh, meet the required basic skills for writing and reading comprehension, while public schools are one-fifth and indigenous schools are almost a half of the children that do not meet the basic skills. And I mean uh, to, to, to be able to write a, in a short sentence a coherent uh, uh, story or narrative or uh, such things. So uh, I think that uh, this, this kind of uh, research where we just uh, uh, not only interview our uh, young people and uh, have data to, to compare, but to be able to uh, give them a chance to write their own stories and leave the testimony, it's a, it's a very important, uh, uh, like a milestone. <laughs> I don't I don't know mm -hmm. how to <laughs> put it in that way. Uh, in this sense of uh, um, uh, making them uh, have spaces where they have not been uh, uh, allowed to, to be heard and uh, read. Uh, um, another, oh, uh, another thing that um, I was thinking uh, about this um, uh, differences and these contrasts uh, on how to uh, how to do they become social uh, and active 
uh, participants in society is, is the, the role of uh, family uh, in the sense that uh, um, I think in, uh, in, in a great uh, number of families, uh, well, family is a very uh, strong tradition in, in Mexico. We, uh, and uh, I think the, pro the process of uh, identity formation, it's just an inverse uh, kind of thing. And you go from a communal sense, you, you are part of the community, and then you get to grow on as an individual. It's mm -hmm. just like an inverse uh, kind of thing. So you go from the we to the I, <laughs> and then you go back as, a, as, as part of the community, but uh, in another sense. I don't know if I'm making mm -hmm. it clear. Right. Right. Uh, so it, it, it's going to be, uh, I think it, uh, it's going to be a very uh, interesting thing on how this uh, question of becoming is going to be answered in, uh, when you take this uh, different kind of, um, of, um, of cultural uh, forms of so socialization. Huh? <clears throat> uh, well, um, I don't know if I, um, I, I, I think this, this, these are the most uh, uh, important things that I wanted to share, but if you later want to, to ask, uh, I would be glad to, to answer them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'll just compliment, um, it's a workshop and we are just starting in some ways, mm -hmm. and, and it's, a, it's a new process for us, a new uh, experiment. And of course, you, you must have more questions uh, then. Uh, it's not easy to understand all, all these in such a small uh, period of time. But I would complement with two things. A little bit about the kids we are looking at. Uh, <coughs> and some are not, would not be called kids, I think. Um, it, it, even even in, in Brazil, maybe not in Mexico. These are young uh, youth, juventude. In Juventude, we have been struggling, the three of us, but also many of us back uh, in my own center, have been struggling with the changing concept of what it is to be a child, what it is to be an adolescent. And youth is almost like, it's not a new category, but mm -hmm. it's, it's new, newly very visible. There are several reasons for this to be happening, and one is a de the demographic aspect of it. We have, uh, for the first time in history, we have a larger percentage of these age, isn't it, Marcia, the age range between uh, 15 and 19. It's, uh, it used to be that we had uh, many more y children younger than 15, and that's, that's shifted. It's, it's, it's larger now. Other factors have to do with the changing nature of the welfare system. Uh, we had um, practices of, as I mentioned in the morning, uh, of uh, large institutions that doesn't exist anymore. Um, we have um, we had other ways in which children participated in their communities that is not in place anymore. So you have more children that are visible out of their communities. The, the, so the visibility we talk about of the street, the so-called street children after the 80s. It's not only that the phenomenon became more visible, really, really globally, it's everywhere. Even in Norway, they want me to talk about street children in a, in a population of four million people, very wealthy, per capita. They, they, they want to talk about street children, runaways, and all those the homeless uh, young people. Um, but there are also interesting changes in family structures, very ra rapid <coughs> changes in family structure that um, has uh, led to smaller families, but uh, busier adults, um, children, that are growing up on their own, 
uh, the easy access to the streets and to be outside the home, uh, especially for boys. They're mainly boys, uh, still is uh, around the world. Um, and of course, as Malcolm mentioned uh, earlier, uh, very disconnected to um, the, the young population, to a, a, a workforce. <coughs> so no, um, no, um, no work and, and um, difficulties in income generation. And the fact that the schools are very poor. Uh, the, the, it's true that most of them do get enrolled when they're seven, eight, but they are off school after three, four years. Yeah. So you, you have, we were talking about this floating, large group of kids that are floating, um, trying to survive uh, on a daily basis, and many of them on their own. So we have this, Nena provoked us with the idea of expanding age. So talking about the concept of childhood and youth, the, I'm not <coughs> sure, and here I'm reflecting with you and provoking you too to debate with us, that it has uh, only to do with the fact that there are less resources out there, which is in part true. But you pick a case like Italy, where the birth rate is, is negative now. So you, children are not being born, but people um, are not leaving home too. So you know, men and women, they are 30, 35, they're st still living with their parents and living as if they were married, not necessarily marrying, but being supported by parents, and how will, will you, we call them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not, a, fa it's not a, a, a fact, like for example in Brazil, that they are not, they don't have a job, they cannot maintain a family. That doesn't mean that they are not having children, because they are having children, and earlier, and the parents have to support raising the children, but it is true that there is an expansion, I think, of that age range there. And as a demographic category, very interestingly, um, the age range from 15 to 24 became incredibly important in my country. So our IBGE, our Institute for Geography and Statistics, that produced the official data, will have um, basically all their indicators uh, related as well to this age range because there is a lot of concern about this population that are not being able to support themselves, get jobs, and eventually support the uh, older generation as well. This brings a, a, a lot of challenges for us to first, I think, just the fact that we are doing research, trying to understand what it is to become a youth will be already a great thing for us in Brazil. I don't find uh, very, say, convincing pieces of uh, uh, work in anthropology and sociology that aren't really explaining more clearly all the implications of this visibility to youth at the <coughs> moment, and definitely what they understand, these people that are young now, how they see themselves in all socioeconomic uh, classes. Mm -hmm. The young people we are trying to attract, then it's one piece of that, it's those that we could say, and they would recognize themselves as active in society, with a role in society, participating in something that they are doing for others. Okay, because we could very well uh, defend the, the um, argument that lead young leaders, an uh, 18-year-old who is a gang leader, I mean, in the drug trade in Rio, very visible and, uh, and, and hated by many, <laughs> they, uh, they have to be incredibly good leaders to, to do what they do and to become alive. We are not going 
in this study, we are not denying that that is a, a role of participation mm -hmm. in society, of leadership, protagonism, agency, you name it, all these <laughs> new terminologies that are, they are also floating mm -hmm. around the world. <laughs> Uh, with a lot of confusion, I think confusion, <laughs> confusing the kids as well, <laughs> the children and the youth as well. Uh, but uh, we will be picking those that feel they, they, they can do something for other people's lives, to improve other people's lives. So most of them, in, in, in the case of uh, Rio, we have 17 interviews so far. These are, are boys and girls that are doing something related, as Nena said, to as a quest for equality, as uh, for respect of rights. Uh, many of them identify themselves with what they are fighting for. For example, uh, young uh, black boys and girls that are fighting for more racial awareness. Um, some in the hip hop uh, movement, in we, uh, or dance and theater, art education, uh, um, um, tools to talk about different aspects of um, um, some political issues, more equality, for example, groups talking about HIV AIDS and uh, gender issues, the, the importance of protection to prevent diseases, uh, including HI HIV AIDS, what else? Uh, we have uh, a few from political parties, which is a very new thing. Mm -hmm. um, these are uh, youths from different socioeconomic backgrounds, and some that are leaders in churches. We're trying to look at different churches that are active. Um, that young people that are active in their churches leading some programs for other children or, and youth or adults. We are s interviewing them. Uh, so in general, the, these are the, 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 this is the profile. We have been discussing then participation. And in some ways, and this is my final point, for us at the center is the first project. It's not the first project that we include young people in our research. We have been working with younger people, including younger people, to, for example, identify community services for children in several low-income communities. So they have been interviewing people with us, different ages, some very successfully, others were, 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 was really terrible for the research because people didn't feel they, they, they wanted to say things to these kids or the kids felt intimidated to ask certain things. So all, we went through all these to discuss some ideas related to the need to engage uh, young people in research and even this uh, idea of children being researchers that no, no. really mm -hmm. makes me nervous yeah but but I, I i see i see that around the world yeah. people defending that and and i more than once got accused of not understanding child participation <laughs> because because i yeah. said well what else do we want them to do they have yeah. to figure out their lives they have to they have to do all they have Grow to up. do to be able to compete in the, in, in, in the job market today with more and more difficult. Besides, they have to figure out what will be their future. The street children, they should, they should be able to plan their lives. <laughs> and so um, in, in some ways, we, we want to be humble in this case to yeah. say, we in universities don't know how to really work together with different people, including young people. And in, in this case, we designed a methodology that would allow it, and it's not being easy in our case. We have the privilege to, in our university, to work with these, uh, we have a group of 10, ten that are actively uh, involved, in which they are, they were interviewed, they said they would like to participate. And that means what? That they would have to write a narrative in like five pages to present th themselves the way they wanted. So that's totally to them. In, in our group, because we have a conference in April, 
we are working with them in that they will write the narratives, they will work together to produce a book together the way they wanted, to disseminate it the way they wanted, and in April they would uh, organize with us this conference. <coughs> Meaning that the way they wanted means that they have to respect that they, they are in a university <coughs> and we are doing this together with them leading. And, and, and the way we want it in the conference for, say, an academic event is to talking to them to see how they feel comfortable to be in this, in, in, in this conference with us without having to be, behave like something they are not. Yeah. So it's to, to stop pretending we are all, or, or all the same or yeah. that we have to prove that we are, we are good. In, in terms of um, letting them participate. And after all, it becomes a stage where they perform, and young people love to do that.